what are the biggest challenges that your team faces during a major snowfall? Park cars. Park, yeah. <laughs> so yeah, that, that is a big one. Please remove your cars from the streets when it's snowing. Welcome to TOA Talks, the podcast from the town of Ajax. I'm your host, Evan Jarvis, the Supervisor of Communications and Engagement. And on today's episode, we're talking with the Director of Operations and Environmental Services, Dave Meredith. Keep listening to hear more about cleanup procedures throughout the year, ways to report illegal dumping, projects that residents should be aware of, and important updates, the Recreation and Parks Master Plan, and much more. TOA Talks. Welcome, Dave. Thank you. Very glad to be here. Looking forward to it. Perfect. And so, Dave, um, we've kind of just been starting off episodes with a little bit of a fun icebreaker game. So if you'd like to choose a piece of paper from the bowl in front of you, I'll read it out. Okay, so Dave, what is your favorite season and activity to do during that season? My favorite season would be fall, primarily because that's when the World Series takes place. Nice, okay. Uh, It is one event that I look forward to the most. But in terms of participation, golf is also sort of a personal interest at that point in time of of year. I find fall golf to be the best time of year for for golfing from a personal standpoint. Well, it's true. It's not too hot out. It's not cold. It's perfect. Perfect. (laughs) Yeah. No, I I 100% see that with sports. So with that, we'll get right into the discussion about what your department does. What does your day-to-day look like in your role? And can you explain a bit about how you got to your role? Actually, I'll explain how I got to my role perhaps first. I started my career with the town of Ajax in 1988. Sort of during that time, I started, my background is in urban planning (laughs) and started as a planning technician in April of 88. Stayed in planning for approximately 15 years, um, at which time I made a switch to the office of the CAO, which was more an opportunity to look at things from an organizational perspective a bit differently, becoming more involved with the strategic planning side of things, Mm -hmm. understanding the relationships and dynamics with our elected officials, um, which I found quite helpful as I moved into the next phase of my career, which was the Director of Operations and Environmental Services, which I started, I believe it was in 2006. So I've been in, okay. that, in, in that role for the most part since since that time. So yeah, my background is a degree in urban and regional planning and my master's in public administration. Um, with respect to the day-to-day activities. At this point in time in my career, there's a lot of time spent in meetings, Right. <laughs> um, whether it's with senior our senior management group, meeting with elected officials, meeting <laughs> with our staff within operations, providing direction, strategic thinking as it relates to how the town responds to the growth patterns that we're experiencing and, and how we position ourselves to sort of be responsive to the changing needs of the town. And in operations, you have multiple sections that have made managers that report into you, right? Correct. And what are those sections? So within our department, we have our fleet section. We have our operations section, which is primarily public works and or roads, environmental services, which is for the most part parks and urban forestry. And then we have our infrastructure and asset management group, which is primarily responsible for a lot of our capital projects regarding roads, parks, playgrounds, sports fields, bridges, etc. We have building maintenance, which is responsible for the maintenance of all town facilities, ranging from the town hall, community facilities, fire hall, and, and so forth. So, so those are the five sections that, that comprise operations and environmental services. That's actually a lot of sections. I didn't realize myself that there were so many. Um, so with that approximately how many staff would be part of your department? We have approximately 80 full-time staff and then we hire approximately 60 to 70 combination of seasonal staff and, and summer students. Okay and so would most of those seasonal staff then be on in the summer or would there also be some that are in the winter months as well? Uh, seasonal staff generally start towards the end of April and mm-hmm. are retained until the early part of November. The only like a seasonal staff we would have are part-time staff in the winter that support our senior snow removal program. Wow, no, that's really cool. And so with all those different sections and um, all those staff that are reporting in, front-facing in terms right. of residents <laughs> are going to know if, if we're plowing streets, if we're cutting grass, yeah. if we're uh, picking maintain, up litter. Maintaining sports fields, picking up litter. But there, there are a couple uh, programs that we look to involve or engage the community. Um, I, I can think of a couple as we think about sort of there's 
an Adopt-a-Park program, I'll use right. as an example, or community cleanups whereby residents can contact operations. We can provide, whether it's garbage bags, gloves, um, what have you, to help maintain and keep the town of Ajax looking great. We also have, it's called a, a LEAF program, right. which is essentially a program for residents whereby the town subsidizes individuals that, that plant trees within their own private yards. So right. so we do have partnership agreements sort of as it relates to, the, to those services as well. Some people get confused as, as far as our crossing guard program goes. Mm. So that is something that takes a considerable amount of time in terms of managing. We have approximately 80 crossing guards and locations in town. So between ourselves and the school board working collaboratively to, to offer that service is, is something that pay, people may or may not be aware of. So with crossing guards then, um, all of those crossing guards would be employed by us and not the school boards? Correct. Okay. That, and so that would be both for the Catholic and public school boards then? That's correct. Right. Okay. On that similar train of thought there, um, what do you think might be the biggest misconception residents might have about the work your department does? The biggest misconception? Sometimes, and I'll just speak to one component of it, is in many cases we're governed by legislation. Mm -hmm. So... That's where sometimes there's thing, there are things that we are doing, there's resources that we're allocating because in many ways we're legislated to, to do so. From a municipal standpoint, to a large extent, we've been governed from a risk management standpoint in mm -hmm. terms of, you know, sort of how we manage our day-to-day -day business. Um, and that relates to services such as winter control, and the plowing of not only our roads, but also our sidewalks, our trails, our parking lots um, are all legislated um, right. There's a mandated rest period, right? There, there's mandated rest periods for when a drivers um, can only drive so many hours before they need a legislated rest period. But there's also response times that were legislated based on a classification of road. And that's not just in the winter. It's also uh, around the clock because in the spring and summer, you know, whether it relates to, again, the same infrastructure, sidewalks and, and trails and, and looking at I guess, defects or deficiencies that require um, improvements or upgrades to manage the, the town's risk as it relates to trip and falls that we will typically or quite often receive. So so there are a lot of things that, and a, and a number of um, hours and resources that are dedicated to preventative maintenance and managing the town's risk based on legislation. Okay. And uh, so you were talking a little bit about snow removal there, and I do think uh, snow removal is a bit of a hot topic. Um, so maybe let's talk about that a little bit more. Um, what are the biggest challenges that your team faces during a major snowfall? Park cars. Park, yeah. So yeah, that, that is a big one. Please remove your cars from the streets when it's snowing. But in all honesty, we, you know, we, we talk about it, but it does have one of the largest impacts, especially in our new north of 401, where we've had our newer subdivisions where the pavement widths may be slightly narrower. You mm -hmm. have cars parked on one side of the street can prevent a plow from going down. From going down and, and the perception is that we're not plowing a street or we're not plowing a, a particular road when that's not the case. So that is one of the reasons that council has made the investment in GPS and dash cams for all of our vehicles this year for the first time. So we will have and be able to see through the eyes of a driver the situations that they experience on a winter event. And I do want to just do a plug there. Um, so the town's live plow map is back. Um, we have upgraded the GPS technology in there. So any residents who are wondering about the status of your street during um, a snow event, you can go to ajax.ca slash plow map. And from there, you can live see where our plows are, when the last time your street was looked after, and kind of see all other winter activities going on. And so, Dave, I, I do want to talk a little bit more about snow. Um, that's one part of the challenge would be actually plowing the streets. But we also provide other um, services like the Senior Snow Removal Program or um, the Program for Qualified Residents. What kind of challenges might your team face um, during that time or providing that service during a major storm? Historically, uh, especially especially our senior snow removal program, the challenge has been resources and our ability to deliver the service within a reasonable amount of time. So right. that's something we've continuously had feedback from residents. We have over 400 residents that are signed up for the program annually. And with minimal part-time staff to deliver the service, it 
could previously take up to five days in order for that service being provided. So I know this year we prepared a report which council subsequently approved in September, allocating and providing us with additional resources to support the senior snow removal program. So they've essentially doubled the, more than doubled the staff that we have available for that program this year. So our hope and expectation is that we have it delivered within a two-day period. If we have, I can't remember if it's eight or nine crews that'll be running to support, two-man crews to support the snow program, senior snow program, that it would probably take two 10-hour shifts for us to get through it. So they would work sort of 10 hours, they would have the rest period and then come back the following morning to to hopefully complete the work. So that's the intended level of service that we're, we're hoping to provide beginning right. this year. I have heard residents kind of ask the question, why can't we have high school students volunteer to do the snow removal program? And for listeners, the program that we're speaking about right now is like shoveling a driveway, sidewalks, clearing a windrow. And I know there's a reason of why we can't have high school students do that for volunteer hours, but could you maybe explain that? There's a couple of reasons. First of all, from a training standpoint, staff and the equipment that they're required to operate to support the senior snow removal program are pickup trucks with with plows. Mm -hmm. So they're not in our minds, conducive to something that would be appropriate for high school students to be operating to support that service. Um, so that's probably one of the, the primary areas. Second, with respect to, again, managing risk and yeah. injury sort of in the workplace as well. There's a number of things that go into play for our staff. It's not only their qualifications, it's their experience, it's their training mm -hmm. that they receive and we manage that that risk to ensure that they're delivering the surface in a safe manner. So it is not something that we would typically look to volunteers or high school students to, to support and deliver. Right, which makes 100% sense. And still on that same wavelength, I know during snowfalls, some um, town hall operations, frontline customer service staff in general get quite a few phone calls. If somebody does have a concern about snow removal on their street or maybe the senior snow removal program, during these active weather events, what's the best way to contact a town staff member to maybe discuss this further? A couple of things. First of all, what I would ask residents is that in the event of a snowstorm, allow a 24-hour period before making a call to, to the town. Right. Because typically when we have our response and we initiate a response that takes the, in a significant event, it takes the better part of a full day to, to complete the work. If, you know, the following day there's reported street that's been missed or if there's something that's um, not been sort of responded to the way a resident may expect, then, then we can follow up sort of on that basis. But we really need that first day to provide an appropriate response. Sometimes it takes us not only to do the initial pass on day one, but we typically take a couple of day days afterwards to clean up the event. So, you know, maybe day one, all the snow is not actually pushed to the the curb, right? That mm -hmm. still may be, you got two passable lanes, but you still continue in subsequent days to follow up and continue to push the snow further to, to the curbs themselves. So, um, so that's one thing that I would ask is some patience, some patience <laughs> in terms of reaching out. Our routes that we do have, they're designated routes. So the plow operators understand their routes and sort of, and it's set up that they will finish the routes in a given shift. So all streets are, are set up to be dealt with in, in any given day. Mm -hmm. um, so everything should be responded to sort of at the end of that first day after a storm. With respect to senior snow, mm -hmm. again, similar. We've indicated that, and we are indicating to residents that sign up now that our goal is to have them complete within a two-day period, within 48, right, 48 hours. hours. So again, we ask for that time to deliver the service. Mm -hmm. And obviously, if there's still questions regarding the, the quality of the service or a missed service where a home mm -hmm. did not receive it, then that would be reasonable to, to follow up and, and have us respond accordingly. Right. And one thing that can slow down maybe getting to a residential street is if it's continuing to snow out. We have to go back to the main roads, right? And clear those again before going to maybe the smaller residential streets. Is that correct? There is different response times for arterial versus collector versus our mm -hmm. local roads. Right. So, And we do have our systems set up so that our collector and arterial roads are being serviced more frequently than local roads. So that is built into the structure that we have in place for winter response. Right. Okay. And okay, so maybe we'll move on a little bit from talking about all this snow in winter. Outside of snow, 
What do you think is the most common inquiry your department receives from residents in the warmer months? Probably the most common, well, sort of month after month, the most common requests that we get relate to trees, okay. um, whether it's street trees or trees and parks. They could be damaged. They could be deemed to be hazardous. So we have a forestry crew that receives numerous work orders on a daily basis to respond and inspect and take the necessary actions. So the Urban Forestry Group is probably our second highest. Our highest would be um, streetlights. Okay. Yep. So that tends to be our number one call is when a particular streetlight is flickering or it's out that we respond through a contracted service to have streetlights pre- repaired. And then I would say the third obviously relates to litter, and garbage mm. collection and, and cleanup. So those in the warmer months are probably our threest from a volume standpoint, right. um, highest comments. And in regards to the litter, just so our residents know as well, while that's a year-round process, of course, and Dave earlier in this episode was mentioning about the litter kits as well, and residents can request those all year. But every April, the town also does our annual Green Living Days. And during that, you'll see the town promoting quite a bit different community cleanups, litter picking. Um, Ajax Council does an annual cleanup at different parks and different neighborhoods. So I definitely recommend residents to look out for that if you have any interest, you know, helping keep HX clean and beautiful in your neighborhood. And just adding to that, I know I mentioned the opportunities for the community to be involved, but once the collections are complete and you've got however many number of garbage bags that you've collected, Mm -hmm. they are generally just kept in one location and then operation staff comes to to collect all the garbage bags of, of what's been cleaned up as well. Oh, that's actually really convenient. Yeah, I was wondering that, like, what do you have to do with the garbage after? So you don't have to put it in your car or anything. You're good. And so, Dave, looking back over the past year here with your team, what's one memory that sticks out to you that makes you proud of your department and its accomplishments? I would say I, I wouldn't singularly sort of identify one moment. But what I would say is we've observed over this past year the increasing amount of garbage cleanup Mm -hmm. that our staff are being asked to do really Really? on a a daily basis. So it's it's something that we haven't typically experienced to this extent, sort of in previous years. There's a lot of accolades that need to go to staff that are being asked on short notice to, Mm -hmm. um, this isn't just a litter pickup sort of in a park setting, it's large volumes of garbage in various locations in town that are occurring for for a variety of reasons that our staff are routinely being asked to to respond to. And again, that's that's part of, of the job in terms of keeping the town looking great and and clean. But based on that volume, it takes away from other things. Right. So while it is a priority, and I do think our staff have done a great job of keeping the uh, the town look looking clean sort of during this past year, it's at the expense of other things. So those people that are collecting garbage are, you know, typically cutting grass or mm-hmm. maintaining sports fields or filling potholes or street sweeping. Right, like their so, primary so, job might not just be picking up so, litter. Yeah. So we're finding, and this is daily, where people mm-hmm. are being taken away from delivering services that residents expect to try and keep the town clean. So our staff have been very positive and understanding sort of when those requests are coming forward. But at the same time, there's there's frustration built in because it's taking away from other things. Right, right. And I know recently there was a fairly large cleanup of a site where there was illegal dumping. How often would large cleanup or are you seeing an increase in illegal dumping throughout the town? In certain yeah. locations, yeah. yes. And these are kind of known locations that people are going back to. Is it kind of the same problem areas over and over again? Um, correct. Yeah. So if somebody was to see somebody illegally dumping, let's say, what should they do in that scenario? Well, they could report it to sort of a number of sources okay. our, ourselves at operations. We'd obviously respond from that perspective, if it's especially if it's on public property. If it extends mm-hmm. onto private par- property and becomes a property standards issue, okay. then bylaw services could become involved. If there's, you know, any illegal activity from a policing service perspective, then, right. then D- DRPS could be a contact as well. So, but really any of those sources would be appropriate to have it reported so that, again, we're aware we can 
a respond and and have it cleaned up appropriately, but but also identify potential behaviors that, that we hope to change. Right. And okay, so with that, um, we are coming a little bit closer to the end of our episode here. Is there anything um, that you wanted to share with residents, like any exciting upcoming initiatives, projects, capital projects that residents could be aware of? I'm just trying to think of what the, the most significant capital projects would be. One of the ones that has made significant headway is... I'll refer to the Ajax cricket field. Mm, yes. So that is something that there's been a long-standing demand for from the cricket community where we, we paid a significant investment in upgrading the Ajax cricket field at, at, Mon- <laughs> at Monarch and Clement. So right. there's a new clubhouse and an upgraded facility that will be a, a state-of-the-art facility. So that's something to be looked forward to. To or forward to in in 2024. Yeah, and then there's just other facilities that we're starting to take a look at next year. As you know, we recently completed our Recreation and Parks Master Plan in 2022. So we're in the early stages of implementing a number of those initiatives. We're starting to look at St. Andrews and doing a feasibility study as it relates to supporting the older adults community and, and what the potential opportunities are for that site. We are looking at the Ajax Community Center and mm-hmm. will be as it relates to the facility itself, but also the opportunity to create a community park on the Harwood North soccer field where we've got plans to... Is that um, the Harwood North field, is that close to Pat Bailey Square there? It's just south of Pat Bailey Square, right. correct. So yeah. north of the sidewalk that extends from Falby Court. So within that area, looking at a future community park that will consider things such as splash pads, skateboard parks, pickleball courts, playgrounds. So we're looking to capture that and and doing some design work and public consultation this year. I know there's some work that's starting with respect and some design work as it relates to looking at a fairgrounds and the creation Mm -hmm. of a fairgrounds up at the Audley Recreation Center. We will be looking at the Pickering Village and the potential redevelopment of the site that housed the Village Arena and the previous branch library. Mm -hmm. So looking at hopefully some form of mixed-use development on that site as well and starting to give some thought and consideration to that as well. So so yeah, there's a few exciting projects for, yeah, quite for a 2024. Few actually. <laughs> and um, for the listeners, Dave mentioned the Recreation and Parks Master Plan, the public consultation period finished in 2022. However, if you would like to check out the plan and see what's included in there, you can definitely do that. It's still on our IMO hub. Just heading to the IMO hub in general, you can go to ajax.ca slash IMO. Or you could go um, directly to the project page for the Recreation Parks Master Plan, which would be imo.ajax.ca slash rpmp. Well, thank you, Dave, for joining us today. Um, It was a really great discussion, and I look forward to talking about your department on further seasons of TOA Talks. Thanks for the opportunity to, to share some information about the department. I'm Devin Jarvis with the Town of Ajax TOA Talks podcast. Episodes can be found on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, YouTube, and on our webpage at ajax.ca slash TOA Talks. Listeners can download and listen to each episode offline or online from their personal device. If you have comments or feedback about our show, you can email corporate at ajax.ca. Thank you for listening, and we'll talk later, Ajax.